colleagues, dear colleagues, dear students, welcome to you all, either here in presence or online. I'm going to be very brief because this is not an event where I give the official formal position of as a representative of the Dutch government. This is an event to create a platform to discuss in a constructive, investigative manner the phenomenon of the north-south divide in Europe. Coming from a country that is normally positioned in the north, I am very much, uh, very often confronted, not always directly, uh, by people who have specific views about us northerners. But living in a country which is normally positioned in the southern category, I also get certain views about them, and sometimes very directly, the southerners. I can have my personal views about these uh, perceptions, uh, but one thing I can't deny is that they exist and that they influence the relations between our countries, our peoples. And my mission as ambassador is actually to enhance, strengthen these relationships. So, I and my colleagues at the embassy, we thought it worthwhile to have the space for a constructive dialogue, a true open dialogue, to better understand, analyze this phenomenon of north-south divide with questions like, is, are they true or false? And are they always harmful or can they be useful as well? And can, how do we deal with it so that they, that they in a positive manner influence our relationships? I think we've managed to gather around this round table uh, a number of very interesting individuals to actually start this dialogue. And I'm not looking for final conclusions. As I said, I'm just looking for better understanding and to start an open and constructive exchange. I really hope that you will enjoy this meeting of minds and I look forward to continue the discussion after it with all of you online, elsewhere, here in Portugal, here in the Netherlands, on how we deal with North and South and us together. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's get the fight started. <laughs> Good, so first of all, just a word of um, gratitude and thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity to be here and to um, moderate this uh, debate. Um, I will, I prefer to call it more the kickoff sort of starter of the uh, debate because I think this will go very naturally and hopefully I will be uh, uh, forgotten at, at some point because the conversation will just flow very naturally. Just to give you a bit of an insight into how we structure this and how we organize this session, um, we will start off with a uh, very brief uh, introduction by my friend von Strompenaars. We've met uh, each other a long time ago already in the Netherlands. We've been working together as well. And um, when the embassy asked who could be someone to talk about this, these topics on culture, I couldn't think of anyone else but Fons. Fons is um, um, a very well-known uh, thinker and consultant and writer and speaker on these topics. And, um, and um, he will give us uh, a brief introduction into this and his views on cultural differences and uh, what science has been showing about cultural differences. So that's um, to set the stage, right? Then we have a debate uh, with our four guests, which I will briefly introduce in a bit. Um, and as I said, I will kick off with one or two questions, but the idea is that to let the conversation flow. And um, uh, we have with us also Pedro Magalhães. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working together uh, also a few times um, in the past, and it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Is you know one of the most uh, uh, versed persons in Portugal when it comes to understanding these issues and uh, and and public opinion and surveys and uh, and all kind of things and political attitudes. So I think you will you will be uh, 
the best person in the end to give us some concluding thoughts after what he observed from the dialogue. That's the, his main role as a narrator, if you want, of the, of the event. Um, and of course, our dear guests, uh, very important. Um, when I was thinking of introducing you, I was thinking, are these really North and South citizens or are they global citizens with uh, some roots in the North or in the South? I think that you can deny your identities, I guess, in that respect. But after the life you've spent, I, it's hard to tell whether you're from the North or from the South or some, just some global citizen. Um, but I think you, that is also interesting to add to this debate, your ability to understand things in perspective, right? So while understanding where you're coming from, you've seen the other side, the shadow side. <laughs> Good, so um, uh, I'll, I'll start with the North just to give a short introduction. Uh, and by the way, I think this North-South thing is a nested concept because in every single country you see the same thing all over again, right? In Portugal we have the North-South divide, in the Netherlands you have the North-South divide. If you cross the border from the Netherlands to Belgium is the North-South divide. <laughs> so I think there's something here. So let's see what uh, we can uh, extract from this, this, this discussion afterwards. So um, I will start off with uh, Ria Katz who's uh, with us here. Uh, she works for the Financiële Dagblad, which is a, a very well-known uh, newspaper in the Netherlands, uh, and she's a correspondent in Brussels. Uh, so uh, I think um, that's inside perspective also of uh, the, the European Union from the Brussels uh, side will be very important, but also the angle from the media and all these things I think can, can add a lot to our conversation. So thank you very much for being with us. Then we have Mathieu Segers, Professor Mathieu Segers. Uh, you know, in Portugal, sometimes you have to be a bit more mindful of that. In the Netherlands, people care a bit less. Um, but um, uh, from the University of Maastricht. And uh, Mathieu Segers is a professor of contemporary European history and European integration at the university. And uh, he holds the Europa chair there as well, right? So. Uh, I think this historical perspective, also an expert on the European integration and what's behind it, I think will be very valuable for our conversation here so that we can ground our thinking on something very concrete and tangible from an historical perspective. So um, that's our South. Uh, you can tell also that we've been very mindful of uh, gender diversity and balance. Uh, to, we thought North and South is enough as a divide. Let's keep it like that. Um, and then representing the South, although Mafalda actually lives in London, so it's a, a bit of a, a mixed sort of, this is what I meant by global citizens as well. Mafalda Damazu, she um, was a visiting lecturer until recently at the King's College, I think uh, very from you know, uh, November onwards, you will also be teaching in the Netherlands, right, at Erasmus University. And um, um, uh, Mafalda is an expert also on culture, media, and the creative industries, and uh, she'll be able to tell us also her views on, um, on, on this. I think especially also taking this sort of sociological perspective as well. So you see you have all kinds of angles here uh, considered. And so thank you very much for being with us. Um, and of course, uh, Jean Mar de Matus, also a very dear friend, Professor Jean Mar de Matus, Vice Rector of the University, uh, Nova University here in Lisbon. And um, also um, a very peculiar background because uh, Zhuang uh, uh, has a PhD in finance and in physics. So he has two PhDs actually. Uh, and he has lived in Portugal, Brazil, and all, Germany, all kinds of places. And um, uh, because at the university he has played a role of dealing with uh, international relations and international development for a long time, here at the business school and later at the, at the old university, he probably has traveled to every single corner in the world. And I was always fascinated by his historical acumen and how much he knew about uh, so many places. And I think that educational perspective and his views of his own personal experience, I think, will be extremely valuable for this, for this conversation. And I think, given the prior comments that we had sometimes some, from people in the financial sector, in the previous financial crisis, uh, I think your background in finance can come out uh, useful as well in this discussion, right? So um, this is it about uh, introduction. As I told you, I'm not here to dominate in any way the conversation, so hopefully you will neglect me after a while. But I'd like to pass the word to Fons now and to give us some short introduction into the topic, and then we'll come back to the debates. 
Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks so much. Wonderful. Let me immediately kick off. Uh, being a, a son of a French mother and a Dutch father, which is a bit the southern part of the north and the northern part of the south, uh, so I've lived it. Uh, by the way, having those parents doesn't make you Belgian. Um, sometimes that's uh, a misunderstanding, uh, nothing to do with that part. Let me start by saying uh, that 20 minutes for an introduction on uh, the divide of North and South will need focus. So I'll focus on some of the research we did, only 40 years. We have 140,000 people in our database where we looked at how do, do different cultures deal with dilemmas? And, uh, and it's interesting, let me give you some one-liners. Any value disconnected from its opposite leads to a pathology. Okay, and the value of a value is does it help you to reconcile a dilemma? Now, if you just remember those two names uh, and these one-liners, then you'll be okay, because that gives a lot of hope to the north-south divide. Let me start by saying um, the big problem today with these type of discussions is uh, twofold. That our models suck and that the models not only are bipolar but also culturally biased. If you look at the leadership literature, and I'll come back to leadership in a second, including politicians, uh, you smell the nationality of the author. So you look at an American leadership book and you see what results that have given lately. Um, you smell America because every five years the same author writes the opposite. Yeah, so 20 years ago it was about courage, now it's about caution. 15 years ago it was about vision, today it's about execution. And I have good news for you. Vision without execution is a pathology. It's called daydreaming. And execution without vision is you fill it in. Vulgar pragmatism. It doesn't work. Um, and, and that is, in a nutshell, American literature, literature on leadership. If you read a French book on leadership, there's only one, because the French like the Americans, but in the reversed order, first think and then write. And um, so one book is enough. And the book is called Les Grands Patrons. Very simple, I'll give you the summary. Did you go to the Ecole Polytechnique? Are you male and born in Paris? Grand patron, right? <laughs> Read a book on Chinese leadership, Yin, Yang, Mao, Fao, Tao. We all know this, right? And that, what, that doesn't work in a multicultural group. If you have Northern Europeans with Southern Europeans, wh which book will you ask them to read? That's one problem. The other problem is, is these type of universities. Although I must say this is the nicest I've ever seen. Um, but MBA type of education, a very implicit way for America to, to make the world stop thinking, um, in the Netherlands better known as mediocre but arrogant, was uh, an interesting education, but they are icons of bipolar thinking. So let's take Myers-Briggs. Have you ever heard of Myers-Briggs, the most used psychological test in the world? If you score high on thinking, you score low on feeling. That's interesting. Great leaders, do they think or do they feel? Like Carl Jung said, that the quality of thinking depends on how you connect them to your feelings, and vice versa. So it's interesting that we have models that exclude one and the other. I teach MBAs, and, and it's interesting, I ask them the famous question, why would an organization centralize, the South, and why would an organization decentralize, the North? And they come with lists of centralization and decentralization, and I say, okay, same question, but now first think, and most of them get nervous because normally that's not part of their education. Now, think about this for a moment. What is the, let me help you. What is the only reason for a company to centralize and the only reason for a company to decentralize? And I'm not interested in your answer because we have 20 minutes. I'll tell you what I want to hear after 20 minutes. The only reason for centralization is decentralization because if you're not decentralized, there's nothing to centralize. Got it? Now, this is not a word game. Let, let's take our human body. Is our human body centralized or decentralized? And the answer is yes. We have centralized certain functions to allow for more decentralization. Now, that's non-bipolar thinking. And that's what we need 
to get out of this interesting discussion and this sharp line. Now, what are ways of doing it? Have a look. Let's follow Einstein. Einstein said, you can't solve a problem at the same level it was created. So if we have a European financial crisis, we ask the Germans to solve it, right? That's not what he meant. What he means is that you have to go one level higher. Okay? Now, what are ways of doing it? This is very popular topics. Innovation, globalization, sustainability, and leadership. Let, let me connect those four in one sentence. It's a German sentence. Globalization leads to different viewpoints of which the essential role of a leader is to connect, which is another word for innovation, is connecting different viewpoints, which leads to sustainable results. So it's all about bringing together opposites. And that's why North-South divide needs to be one of integration, where you need the divide, because if you're not divided, there's nothing to integrate. Now, this is the old paradigm. The North, obviously, square, and the South, the ellipse, or the circle. But what I want to leave you with is a way, and I'll give you many examples in a second, is there is a higher level. These, we, as cultures, are just the shadows of a cylinder. Okay? Another more academic way of saying it is we all, as human beings, share the same dilemmas, but the approach to the dilemmas is cultural. And, in other words, the whole has something beyond the parts, but includes them. Now, this is dialectic, and, and I'll come back to that with some examples. This is an interesting one. My wonderful colleague, Charles Hamden Turner, said, to create wealth, and that's what we're talking about in the broader sense of the word, is to combine values that are not easily joined, therefore scarce, therefore profitable. Okay? Innovation as well. So Apple has combined aesthetics and functionality. The Formula One has reconciled speed and safety. It's called aerodynamics. Okay? While normally we say, is this car speedy or is it safe? No, you can combine the two, but it needs another mindset. And that's what I want to leave with you. Now, let me give you four steps. First of all, help you in recognizing cultural differences. We'll give you some examples. Then respect those differences, because normally these models of culture lead to stereotypes. Uh, respect is knowing that we are dealing with the same dilemma, so both sides are okay. Then reconcile those, and what can I do to realize it? Now, first a little model of culture. There are many models, but I love the one of Ed Shine. Ed Shine says, culture has many layers. It's like an onion. And be careful, if you unpeel it, it makes you cry. On the outside, we have explicit culture. It's, it's the products and artifacts of culture. Eh? It's, it's behavior, it's the way we meet, it's the food we eat. But be careful, it covers a deeper layer of norms and values. And when the value becomes a norm, it slips out of consciousness and becomes a basic assumption. Now, a last point on this one is if I ask you, what are the norms and the values of the North? And what are the norms and values of the South? And people get nervous because they don't have a clue. It's a bit like writing a constitution for Europe. If you ask an American or, or a Chinese, which we should have done, by the way, to write the constitution for Europe, you get one page and you say, wow, never thought about that. Why? You need to be an outsider to know what your culture is. Don't ask a fish what water is, okay? Now, the point I'm trying to make here is uh, that we need to go to basic assumptions, the values that have become norms. And one warning, since we have 20 minutes, I'll stereotype. This is Dutch culture, but there are different Dutch people. You cannot imagine, but there are. And this is Portuguese culture, but what we normally do is we exaggerate the difference. I think, personally, it's much too easy to say don't stereotype. We do it all the time, right? But you may do it if you use models because the worst people are saying you should not stereotype. By the way, let me show this by a model. A model is the best example of a stereotype. It reduces complexity. But if you know it's an exaggeration, it's okay. And secondly, don't make it negative. Okay? Now, let me go to uh, a little model of culture's <laughs> definition, namely, culture is a dynamic process of solving human problems that come to us as dilemmas in areas of human relationships, time, and nature. 
In human relationship, we distinguish five elements of which I want to test your competence to deal with opposites in a second. These are the, the, the seven dimensions that we use. And by the way, I can tell you the difference between north and south are tremendous for all seven. And uh, I'll give you some insights in that. Now, first, rules versus exceptions. I've done 40 years of research, started in 79, looking at 10 refineries of Shell in 10 parts of the world and looking at the effect of national culture over corporate culture, organizational culture. This was one of the questions that I asked to about 140,000 people today, then 12,000 in Shell. The question is as follows. You're riding in a car driven by a close friend of yours. Your friend is speeding, going 50 kilometers an hour where you're allowed to go 30, and your friend hits a pedestrian. You come to court, and the lawyer of your friend says, don't worry, you're the only witness. Two questions. First question is, what is the right of your friend to expect you to help him by lying? My friend A has a definite right, some right. Second question is, would you lie, yes or no? Now, I have asked this, like this, to about yearly 15,000 people, and I've never had an individual, when I asked the question, would you like to be in this situation, that said, nice situation to be in. And I've done this in the north, and I've done this in the south. So one thing we have in common, if I ask why didn't you do this, is, or why don't you like to be in this situation, they say, in other words, this is a dilemma. There's nobody in this room, correct me, north or south, that wouldn't like to help friends. And there's nobody in this room that doesn't have something with the truth. But then you look at the answers, culture creeps in. So culture could be defined as killing humanity for about half. Because as a human being, we have all values in us, north and south, but it's one that starts dominating. Okay? Now, that's the point I want to make. Now, companies, and I want to make the bridge between companies and Europe, if you like, which is much more complex politics, by the way. I hate politics. Too complex for me. In business, at least, they take action. Now, this is called the dilemma of universalism versus particularism. You know those people in the North, right? They like consistency. There are system standards, uni uniform procedures. They talk about transparency. You know the new inventions of Americans. Be transparent so if somebody's ugly, you can tell them. And, and give them details why they're ugly, big ears, and that kind of stuff, right? And the letter of the law. You go to southern Europe, and here we are, be flexible, be pragmatic. There are exceptions. It depends. I was in a French group, starting of, of, of the south, and uh, there was an exceptional British lady who stood up and said, Mr. Trompenars, I answered B, some right, but it could have been A or C, you remember, if I just knew what happened to the pedestrian. So I said, dead, very dead. Then a, uh, there was a French lady stood in, straight up and said in great irritation, why didn't you say that from the beginning? And she said, yeah, I answered B myself, but now you're telling my friend killed the pedestrian, I realize I should have answered A. And you had to see the face of the British, British lady. Now it's known in the UK, the more your friend needs help, the less he gets it, yeah? <laughs> While, uh, and that's called Brexit, right? <laughs> While in France, oh, the pedestrian was dead anyway, so let's help my friend. Okay? Now, why are you laughing? Because uh, I, I have little professional, uh, except today, but little professional highlights in my life, but I was once invited by John Cleese to do workshops with him. Now, you know John Cleese, comedian, and he says, Fons, I want to work with you because you're talking about dilemmas. The essence of humor is when two opposite logics both turn logical and it makes you laugh. Arthur Kessler, by the way, yeah? So humor is very important to say, ah, ah, yeah, there's another value. Now, companies have known these dilemmas and say, yeah, we know Northern Europe are more, ah, there's the Protestants and God is always checking you and you feel guilty all the time because God saw it. 
while in the south it's all Catholic and ah, God was perhaps not looking and if he looked he will understand and if not we have confession, right? So that's one point I want to not forget making. Um, here we have our, uh, now this is not 140,000, that's our complete database. This is, and I, I, I took light uh, of, of the, what, what we could call kind of northern countries, and in, in light yellow, southern countries, and the average of the two groups. Now, th these are not small differences. This is about 80,000 people, okay? Um, now, if you, we would stop here, people in the north would say, oh, thank you for your database. I know that people in the south are corrupt because they always help their friends. Till I did a workshop in Korea, by the way, and a Korean came to me and said, I know the Americans are corrupt, and you proved it. He said, what do you mean? You can't trust them, they won't even help their friends. <laughs> so we're back to the limitations of any value. Now, organizations have said, by the way, this is an app that I will make available for you. At, we'll, we'll give you the slides where you can download it, where we have, depending on, on the difference, you get tips. Tips like, uh, okay, the explanation, but also did when doing business with the Dutch, and uh, et cetera. And we have it for 140 countries. Yeah? And the first Dutch question, it's for free, I hope. Right? Sure. <laughs> now, the dilemma in Europe between North and South, do we need global standards? Or do we respect cultural diversity? What I want to do in your mind is crack the line and exaggerate the exceptions, uh, the, uh, the, the um, extremes. This is the global organization. It's the American idea of the rest of the world. And you standardize everything. Uh, in, in consulting, it's called McKinsey Consulting. Where they have a workshop, how can I fake listening to a client? Then we have the decentralized multinational that is the big four. Yeah, they do their local dances, and the only thing they share is the logo. The compromise is the Statue of Liberty with the local flag. Now, this is what we need to become in Europe, the transcultural organization. Now, four characteristics. Let me quote. We need shared values, but yin and yang values. Uh, there's nothing worse than a value like collaboration, because collaboration without individual accountability doesn't work. Um, so I know the popular organizations today, and I hope Europe will work on that too, purpose and values, but uh, formulate them as yin and yang. We strive for teams that consist of creative individuals. Perhaps for the Dutch, we give people direct feedback with diplomacy. It's a long workshop, yeah? <laughs> These are polycentric organizations. So it's not only Brussels, and perhaps beyond Strasbourg, but, but get centers, and I think Europe has ticked the box on all four in a way, but it needs further development. Learn locally, take the best practices which you globalize, and find a way, finally, a shared leadership model. Tick the box for Europe. I truly believe that there needs to be done a lot of work in this area, especially what are the systems where you show, openly share, like here, best practices between North and South and together reconcile to even the best of all practices uh, that you can imagine. Now, individual group, I'll be very short, but big differences, I won't discuss it because everybody knows this. By the way, you get the data, here we are. Uh, Spain was pretty on the individualistic side. Uh, don't forget that English is one of the few languages where I is written with a capital letter. Yeah? Uh, and, and, uh, and we had once upon a time uh, a capital U uh, an ick with a small i. It's just an interesting uh, little note. But we know this dimension, so I don't want to say too much about it. Um, we need to reconcile, and what can we learn is perhaps what parents do with their kids, reward teams for their individual creativity and reward individuals for what they do for the team. Now, I would like to uh, just, and I'm almost done, I, I don't have a clue what the timing is, but my mother is French, that often happens. <laughs> Specific versus diffuse. I think it's the most important dimension of culture <coughs> in this respect. And it was based on the work of Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin was a, a German Jewish guy who in the 30s went to America, became very famous worldwide. Fantastic theories, field, field psychology. And he described, not so known, but I read the article with great interest, his um, experiences on his culture shock as a German in America. 
And I would like to uh, use it as a metaphor to north-south. And that is what I call the peach and the coconut culture. Kutle Wynn said, you hardly know Americans and they talk to you. It's because they are like a peach, they have a lot of public space and a very small privacy. We Germans are like a coconut, tough to enter, but once you're in, it's soft. Now, let's take this, um, Amer he calls it the U-type. The U-type is where people before you know are in your refrigerator. You need a car, no problem, take my car. Have you tried this in Germany, take my Mercedes? Are you kidding? No way, he's my wife, but leave my Mercedes, okay? And we have furniture. Furniture, people in America, I've noticed it, I, I lived a couple of years there, is they have a, a chair and they leave it. Now, our house is loaded with antique, the old rubbish we can't get rid of. But they are very private because they have a story. And not in America. Now, according to Lewin, this leads to a specific relationship. If I relate to you and you relate to me, cut the crap, what is this about? Now, final point here, titles. When I got my PhD, this was at Wharton, I suddenly was called Dr. Trompenaars. At the barbecue, suddenly I was Fonz. Because in, in America, you are doctor in the university and Fonz at the barbecue. In Germany, you are hair doctor everywhere. You buy a steak at the butcher, good Abend, hair doctor. You come home, good Abend, Frau doctor. Where are the little doctors? Everything is doctor. <laughs> and initially, there is no relationship. And they call you Z and not do. But around October, Munich, this happens. Now, the big problem between North and South is where the peach meets the coconut. And this explains, for example, the style of communication. For the Dutch, the peach, the point of the arrow is in their public space. We wrote a book, obviously you all read it, The Seven Cultures of Capitalism, and the chapter on the Dutch was called You're an Idiot, but don't take it personal, right? That's this model. While in the South, they're more like coconuts. Difficult to enter, but once you're in, you share everything, right? What is the reconciliation of this? Is moments of truth. One tip, if North talks with South, take a lot of private moments. Because this is another word for loss of face, right? Final point, oh, this is how we measured it, by the way. Answer A, obviously, is specific. You're the boss in the company, not outside. Versus diffuse, he or she is my boss everywhere. Have a look. So you see, you rather not be a boss in the Netherlands. That's very known, but we are developing new leadership in the Netherlands, yeah? Namely, how to piss off the others is the new dictum. Um, okay, explained in the app. High tech, high touch is another one. High tech is specific. High touch is diffuse, and we need to combine. The final one, on status. Is status based on what you do or who you are? This is lost democratic leadership, the best model for the Netherlands. This is the title of a book with the subtitle, The Dutch and Swedish Disease. You can have too much democracy, right? Everybody has a say. And it doesn't matter if you have one seat in the parliament or 23, you get your hour, my God. Now, we only, fortunately enough, have 19 parties. So discussions are easily done. Um, but it's democracy over the top. Now, try the Middle East. Follow the leader, no feedback, it's top down, it doesn't work. My final point, if we want to take advantage of cultural differences north and south, we need to develop a leadership model that is based, and Milton has even done his PhD in that area, that's one of the reasons why we met, and sorry for all these male-dominated cartoons, but it was an English guy who drew them. Um, it's never me. It's the person holding the ladder for others to climb. And the best model for me is very simple. If you are a mother or a father, you know exactly what it is to be a servant leader. You're there to make your kids perform better than you, or at least for their own standards. And that might mean that you're severe at some times and less at others. What I would like uh, to say is that dilemma thinking uh, has some steps. Europe's culture, culture's future is dependent on how we deal with diversity and the dilemmas that it's creating. Reframe a problem as a dilemma on the one hand, on the other hand, which shows respect, by the way. Instead of emphasizing conflict, say, what can I do with X that increases Y and vice versa? 
combine hard and soft processes, know what to share and where to be different. And that is something, or the, uh, that is something that I would like to advise Brussels, because creating wealth is that you know your Europe and include it. Why? Because then we can take advantage of diversity. And it's done, the quality of the rope, by leadership. And what I see, Brussels is almost as big as, uh, uh, as you can see here, as, as big as, as the pendulum. And it needs to be much sharper, much more in intelligent. So I would give the advice, fire about 3,000 people there, get the top 200 that doesn't give me, last week uh, we had to hand in the ladder of our people who cleaned the house and they couldn't do our sleeper at the top and they said, yeah, there's a new rule from Europe in the number of trays a ladder can have. Come on, there are more important things to do. And I'm not talking about the shape of a banana because that's a fake story. This is my story, much too long, I'm so sorry, but I thought this might help in the discussion. Thank you very much. All right, so I think with that introduction, we can start the debate in here. And I, I'd like to uh, take it where Fons left it, with Brussels, right? And I guess, uh, Ria, I think I'll have to turn to you. Because it seems apparent that this north and south divide is real, right? So it, it seems to be there, right? Uh, it is there, uh, but it's not as um, divisive as Fons uh, yeah. pictured is. I, I don't think so, no. Yeah. So do you, do you, if you, if you, you know, you talk with people, you, 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 you walk through the corridors in Brussels of the European Commission, how much of this north and south divide really plays in their you know, discussions, their dialogue? Is it obvious? Is it apparent? Is it not? Yeah, Brussels has as much space as the member states give it. So, uh, for example, with, uh, what Fon said about the stairs and, 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 and the ladder and, and, and the, 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 how many stairs it was uh, yeah, allowed. Steps, something, steps, steps, yeah, steps, yeah. Uh, precisely. Um, this is not something Brussels decides. This is something the member states will decide. This is a, a, a huge misunderstanding. I think it's, it's there all around Europe that Brussels decides a lot. No. We, as member states, do that. So Brussels, uh, all it does is listening to the member states, how much space, how much room for maneuvering do you give us to make new legislation? So this is a, a huge misunderstanding, and I think we should uh, point, point this out, because um, without uh, this... Um, this discussion, we always have politicians in the member states that, uh, who can blame Brussels mm. for like everything. And it's that's the problem in the Netherlands in and probably it's the same in the South as well. Uh, we are finger pointing at each other instead of trying to find solutions that will serve all of us. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is that eventually what happens is that people blame Brussels as an excuse, the local politicians blame Brussels as an excuse to get away with some of the things they can do, right? So, and then it creates this message in this Yeah, but also blame out. them for legislation that they uh, agreed upon mm -hmm. them yeah. themselves, themselves in Brussels. Yeah. If they um, discover that some legislation is very unpopular in their home countries, they just say, they never say, well, uh, actually, well, we were the ones who decided this. No, they say, well, it's Brussels is to blame. Yeah. So they are creating this enemy, this en enemy from outside of their country to, uh, to become popular and to um, gain popularity in their mm. own countries. Yeah. Okay. And so that's also uh, one of the reasons why uh, there is uh, this north-south division. It's very easy to blame the other in the yeah. south, in the west, in the east, yeah. in Brussels. Yeah. Well, I guess then we could maybe ask Mafalda, since uh, you have been, you've been living in the, in, in the UK and maybe having experienced also Brexit, I think this phenomenon probably happened quite obviously in the UK where, you know, this sort of scapegoating and effect, you know, trying to blame Brussels for things they were not to blame took place. Is that something that you really experienced? And I had a follow-up question for you, which I think would be interesting because it seems like we're lacking a sort of a, a, an European identity somehow that would kind of overcome this sort of apparent north-south divide. You know, are we far from this idea of a, an European identity or? Yeah. Oh, that's a big question. Yeah. Okay, so the Brexit, um, 
Brexit issue, yes, absolutely. And I have to say the Remain campaign, I was a volunteer. I was volunteering for Remain leafleting. Um, I wasn't really called that many names, but I was told, because I, I do have an accent, so I was told, what are you doing? This is in your country. There were people that were leafleting with me that were um, spat at, so it was quite oh, wow. violent symbolically. Um, but, you know, we were doing it because we believed in it. And many of us Europeans couldn't vote. But the, both campaigns were very um, UK-centric. Even the Remain campaign was only talking about what we can gain. Uh, it was never talking about the EU as a project and as a project that was shared and a project that could be even improved with the, uh, you know, uh, action of namely the UK in collaboration with others. So it was very insular, I felt, absolutely. And this goes to the issue around identity. Is there an European identity? So I'm, I'm very lucky, I am, you know, I feel that I am a daughter of Europe in the sense that I've, you know, I've done Erasmus, I've done a PhD funded by the EU, and FCT see the Portuguese, uh, um, like, you know, a research council, but I'm really a product of the EU. I did a master's in Belgium because I could, because of freedom of movement. Um, and, and, you know, the more I travel, the more I realize that, in fact, Europe is home. Yes, there are differences. In some places, the food that we will eat is slightly different or that is, is cooked, and the way how people, I don't know, organize their lives will be slightly different. In the Netherlands, right? One works very hard, and then at six... Yeah. One can just take a, a chair, if it's sunny, you take a chair or two chairs out in front of where you live, a glass of wine, and you enjoy the sun. This is amazing. This is not something that one would do in Portugal. Small differences. But in fact, then the reality is that we're very similar. We all believe in, I think, the fundamental values of the EU, right? Uh, you know, rule of law, uh, democracy. We're different and we can be together. And it's so interesting to learn from people who have different views and lives and, and approaches and backgrounds. So I do think that we have a shared identity. Uh, now, the problem, I think, is that there's a certain sense that um, this will continue to trickle down miraculously, I think. Mm, and, yeah. you know, I work in cultural policy, and I hear a lot, we hear lots of politicians who talk about how um, we have a shared culture, shared identity, but then you actually look at the funding, it's almost nothing. If you really want, if you really want to, sh to believe, to, you know, to support a, a shared transnational approach to, to Europe, we need to build it. And yes, of course, trade helps. Yes, exchanges help, of course. But uh, we need to focus on what connects mm, yeah. us. And this, you know, there are some projects that attempt to do it increasingly now. Small independent projects. There is, you know, Euronews, other which uh, is, is very specific. So there are some things, but it's just not enough. Yeah. And I would like to see that effort to um, remind us. It's not even to build. It's to remind us of what we share. Because, um, you know, it's just not going to trickle down miraculously yeah. from the single market. That's my opinion. So, so could it be that it become, we're becoming a bit too transactional also in Europe and also more economic driven and financially driven and not and forgetting indeed that cultural... Just, that's what you're trying to say, I guess, right? So. I mean, I think... I don't know. Maybe you, you can... You have the, you'll have a, the, you know, um, some comments on that as well. But I think that there's a mismatch between the hopes and the dreams yeah. of political leaders and then the political, um, the, the European project. Yeah. I do think that it's there. I do think that it's there. Uh, when you listen to um, political leaders, there's a belief in that uh, shared European identity. But um, perhaps because they tend to come from elite, elites, yeah. perhaps that's why they take it for granted. Um, and so perhaps because of that, it's, ki it's then forgotten how to actually yeah you know, implement yeah. that. That yeah. would be my theory. Yeah. I guess maybe Mathieu would be a good, to, you know, point there for you to take it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, maybe, maybe three brief um, observations, also reacting to what was said. <coughs> uh, the first thing that Brexit learns us, I think, is that to look at the European integration project from a purely rational point of view doesn't yeah. explain anything. So this was the Brits left the European Union when it was more British than it ever had been the European Union. That is an irony of history. And it was against their interest. It's clear now why, while they are trying to yeah, uh, set up the, uh, the alternative to the European Union. So that is the first thing I think very important. Emotion 
is, is driving this pro process more than we know. We always explain it in rational terms, that's not enough. We should quit that and we should include this emotional dimension. And I come back to that later. The second thing is European identity. This is uh, indeed, this is a very, very hard question. I'll give you a historical anecdote. Um, briefly after the Second World War, the United Kingdom was in the lead in Western Europe to organize Western Europe. Then the then Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ernest Bevin, said, I want a Western European Union, and it should be built around a Western European identity. And then after a couple of weeks, uh, his policymakers in the ministry said, Minister, what do you mean? What, what, what is a Euro Western European identity? Oh, I don't know. I, I never thought about it. But let's ask Isaiah Berlin, the philosopher in Oxford, and he will come up with an advice. So they asked Isaiah Berlin. He worked a couple of months. He was annoyed by the request, of course. <laughs> and then he wrote like 15 pages. You can still read it. And the conclusion is, dear minister, you're looking for something that does not exist. There is no Western European identity. This is all about diversity and different collective memories. And that is the last point I want to make. This collective memory dimension links to both things, to the identity thing, but also to the rational, emotional balance. If the world gets uncertain around you, in, in Europe this is the case. If we compare it in Western Europe with the, the Cold War years, this is a very uncertain time. A multipolar world with a lot of threats at the, directly at the borders and even within society. The trente glorieuse are behind us, also economically. So there is a lot at stake, uncertainty increases. If uncertainty increases, people look for certainty and they look, they, they start digging in their collective memories. And then we have a collective memory of European cooperation that is a couple of decades deep. That is not so deep, that is very vulnerable because there is another collective memory, well, that of the nation yeah. and that of the nation state yeah. that in almost every example goes far deeper than a couple of decades. So people then tend to, uh, to, 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 to go to that deeper collective memory because it's older and therefore more credible to invest in if you look for certainty. And that is a great problem because this is a credibility problem for the European Union and we see this, and I end on this, especially in the east-west divide, where the uncertainty is very high in the east because also of the threat for, from Russia. People are looking for certainty and they don't believe in after European. two decades or three decades what the European Union is offering them. They rather choose for a more st a stronger, yeah. deeper collective yeah. memory and that is that of the nation and the tradition and the national yeah. uh, approach. So, so maybe, uh, I don't know, Jerome, uh, <laughs> what your thoughts are on this. Um, I think there's something then, that wor there's work to be done, right? But where to start, right? We, we seem to know that we need to build somehow this sort of sense of collective memory as an European. So what can we do? And of course, you working in universities, this is probably a field where this collaboration, cooperation across, you know, this divide is probably more obvious. I don't know, but do tell me, you know. Yeah, uh, interesting way of posing the question, actually. Uh, and the topics are so you know, various and different that we can approach it in many different ways. Giorgio Parisi just uh, two days ago got the Nobel Prize for Physics. And one of the things he has worked on is on fluctuations in disordered systems, but at different scales. It's scale invariance, basically. And I can observe this problem that we're describing here at various different levels. Certainly at university level, this university that you are in right now is university with quite different units, nine of which can be compared to European countries. And each of them have a completely different organizational culture. And sometimes I face the challenge of dealing with this uh, confronting but actually potentially cooperative interests. And I have to trigger, or to figure out ways of triggering the right incentives to make people actually talk to each other and understanding each other. So at the microcosmos level of the university, this kind of problem is still, yeah. is, is, is still posed. But I mean, coming from physics and then from mathematics, I would take a geometric perspective of this. And uh, uh, you know, in, in times of pandemics where people are denying the role of vaccination and all that, there are people actually still insisting that the world is flat, but flat means at least two dimensions. And when we put the position or the discussion in terms of north-south, 
we are making it one dimensional, which is even you know, worse than yeah. the flat world. So I would go, I mean, being in Portugal, I, I have to, to recall that the first division of the world was in the 15th century when the Portuguese and Spanish decided to make the Tordesillas line uh, following the decision of the Pope, and which actually allowed the, the King of France to have a good laugh at it, because you know, what, what do you mean with this, like <laughs> dividing it? But then there was a meridian, and I, 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 I went to the Webster's. It says that the meridian is an imaginary line so it's a division that is based on the imagination. Now, Fons gave us data and facts that tell us that the division is more than imagination. But the fact is that this imaginary division of the world had, like uh, Mrs. Ambassador said, political implications. And one of the most remarkable political implications is that in Brazil, for instance, nowadays, we speak Portuguese. And that is the result of that imaginary line say so to say. And I actually grew up in Brazil for a long period of my life. Uh, and when I lived in Brazil, the North-South issue was between the developed countries and underdeveloped countries. Now, then I moved back to Europe and then eventually to Portugal and I realized, like you, you said, can't. that it was poor to Lisbon issue. Like, yeah. <laughs> and actually the, the North-South thing is, is, is a construct, is a social construct that we build upon our differences and our diversity. You know, fully explored here. And in Brazil, that's going back to Brazil, using my Brazilian experience, what really impresses the Brazilians about Europe, and they are really fascinated by Europe. They, they you know, they are Americans wannabes. We know that, that's their social model. But they are really fascinated about the cultural, the European, cultural way of life. And what they really appreciate in Europe, it's something that we never valued enough, is that if you are in Brazil, and if you travel by car, two hours, you're still in Brazil. If you travel three hours, you're still in Brazil. If you travel 10 hours, you're still in Brazil. If you travel 20 hours, you're still in Brazil. It's 8,511,965 square kilometers. Europe has 10 million square kilometers, roughly speaking, but it's comparable. The point is, you travel from Lisbon two and a half hours away, you speak a different language, you are in a different country, and you are in a place that does not behave exactly like you, but you have been in touch with for centuries. And we are an ongoing social experiment. That's what Europe is. You're looking for an identity in Europe. You say it's hard to find, because it's an ongoing work. I mean, I mean, we have been in social interaction for centuries and centuries, usually in the way of wars, basically. That's how we are used to interact, driven by you know, economic incentives or factors or drives, uh, power, territory, land, uh, market. Uh, so things have evolved, right? And at a certain point, when uh, mankind actually realized that they have the power of self-destroying itself, <laughs> people came to a point where they said, look, at this stage, perhaps we should stop and think, <laughs> right? And try to figure out how can we actually turn this diversity into a plus and build something in common. So, yeah, the Brexit, brought it to life that this new generation that did not participate of the construction of Europe does not understand what was the aim of Europe. So what was the aim of Europe was to build a kind of a groupment of very diverse, I insist and I recognize, I cannot deny Fons uh, data, right? Who am I to deny data? Uh, uh, but the, the point here is that we have this chance of building upon our diversity to build something better. And people at the end of the day who were born too late are asking what is in there for us. Uh, I see the same thing here in Portugal. I lived, I was 13 years old when the revolution came. I was in the streets. I understand what it meant. I went to Brazil, unfortunately, for, because of the, of, of the revolution a couple of years later, because of the instability in Portugal. But that was probably the best thing that happened in my life because provide me, it gave me 
a view of the world that I would have never got if I would have been stuck here. Yeah. That's one thing that Portuguese people do. And, and just they to, have done that. They have yeah. traveled around the world. The Portuguese, has, they have brought to Europe and to the European diversity a lot of input from what yeah. they've seen around the world. And guess what? They have that in common with a couple of other European yeah. cultures and civilizations. I won't name them, yeah. but you know who they are. So, so I have two thoughts on that. One is that, taking on that line there, which I find is really interesting, is that could it be that this divide will dilute as this Erasmus generation that has been traveling around in Europe so much. So I know it's a bit more of the affluent, you know, at the universities we see this, you know, at NOVA we have 60% foreign students and all this traveling. Could it be that this identity will gradually, you know, evolve naturally and as older people, you know, what, die, that somehow this sort of north and south divide and this divide become less obvious? Yeah, it's actually, it, to some extent it's true and that's quite interesting, your question. I never thought in that way. I was talking about revolution because most of the kids today, our students at university, they don't have a clue of what a revolution meant. And it meant so much for us. Because it meant the change of mentality. And we know Portugal today. And we know how Portugal was in the 70s. And I know how different it is. Probably much more different than other European societies yeah. in between those two periods of time. I understand evolution. I guess that most of it is due to Europe. But regarding and coming back to the university and the students, that is actually the opposite to the Brexit process. I was in, at Nova when I came in in, in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, this school, this very school where you are today, was a parochial school. Very good, technically good, you know, formally a, a good school of economics. It was, didn't have an MBA. <laughs> it started an MBA, actually, when I was here, it uh, had already started. The first MBA program in Portugal. But it was a school that uh, was efficient, good, qualified, but recognized as a parochial school. And our challenge was, our challenge was, during a certain period of time, 10, 12 years, to turn this school into one of the top European business schools. And we did that to some extent. Yeah. We did that successfully. And that goes through the acceptation and the integration of uh, European students, basically European students. We say that we're very international, we are but 85% of our students are essentially yeah. European, yeah. benefiting from Erasmus and Bologna yeah. mobility, that kind of thing. And that process helped integrating uh, the institution school yeah. into the European panorama, which is different from the society. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I'd, I'd like to take also on Fon's last remark, and also what I heard, it, and it seems that we're missing leaders or leadership, and I know I'm professionally biased on this one, but it, it, it does seem that we're missing that leadership that is able to build those bridges and reconcile those opposites, right? Are we lacking leadership in Europe to overcome these issues? Because sometimes we actually see the, the leaders themselves, you know, uh, using an unfortunate statements that actually emphasize the differences and polarize instead of overcoming the differences. And I, I kind of and of course, Europe is strong for the institutions, we know that. Are we missing leadership in Europe then? Is that what we're missing? And I throw it on a table, whoever wants to pick up. Are we missing leadership? That's a very hard question. I don't think so. I think what uh, Europe needs is a common goal. And uh, uh, actually, I see common goals coming up. Um, China, the threat from China, uh, Facebook and the other uh, dig digital companies uh, that can rule our way of living if we don't uh, stop them. Uh, we have Russia, which is a, a giant threat, Belarus, uh, the rule of law, the, um, Brexit. Uh, since Brexit, you see a lot of especially young people, but also other people who think, well, we need Europe. We cannot abandon Europe. Mm. Even in the Netherlands, um, Euroskeptics, uh, Euroskeptical people um, uh, well, admit it nowadays that we need it. We, need, we, cannot do, uh, we cannot fight China on our own. We cannot fight Russia on our own. We cannot um, um, have an honest way, a fair way of trading uh, with on our own, we have to um, we have to yeah. deal on this in Brussels. So, uh, I think this common goal will uh, get us um, 
where we need to be. We need that's that's what makes in the end European identity. Mm. Uh, as, but it's very hard to be a European leader nowadays because you're not only a European leader; you're always a leader in your home country. Your country as well. Even <laughs> Ursula von der Leyen is German. If she does something um, well bad. Uh, the German press will kill her. You, 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 you have seen it. Uh, I think in January and February when yeah. uh, we had this uh, this disaster with uh, the vaccines. So you, you you cannot be only a European leader. I think it's very hard to 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 find one uh, unless we have some kind of new Napoleon. But this is something <laughs> that modern people especially dislike. Yeah. So I don't think I don't see that coming. We do we do need common goals, and I I think. Yeah, I think there's so a common sh- ground. Yeah. So we're having a shared goal, a shared purpose. Yeah. Uh, although there's a paradox in that, right? So if you polarize against China to overcome our differences, uh, you're creating no, 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 a no, no. Divide. You can, of course, you can polarize, but you can also make it a positive agenda. Okay, mm. this is Europe. We have our common values. We have democracy. We have a rule of law. We have freedom of press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have uh, all these very valuable things we should defend together, and. That's uh, also a way of uh, competing with China, with Russia, yeah. with even the United States. Yeah. Trump did more for the European integration <laughs> than, than, uh, he, than, than he, he could have than he wanted. <laughs> than he wanted, yes, especially. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, Mathieu, I think also it might relate also, because uh, if you think um, from a systems perspective, right, you know, the way you actually start the project will condition it forever, right? So the way we built our institutions, the way we designed the thing to start with developed into this, right? And we have all this legacy. So can we actually reform our institutions and, and so that we have the leadership that we need to overcome these differences? And I know it's a very yeah, hard this question. Is, this is, but this is a very good question. So first of all, I fully agree. Beginnings are important. You know, you have only one beginning yeah. of uh, a great idea or a project. or So that is that is absolutely true. But what I think here is on a meta level is very important is, and what we lack at the moment in the European (coughs) Union is self-understanding. We still see ourselves compared or as a, as a, as a, as a, um, an offspring of the American example in the end. Mm. We are, for instance, a a great, a, a fascinating paradox to me in the European integration process is that we are so focused on scale efficiency um, uh, competitiveness. This is something that was exported from abroad yeah. to Europe. If you look to the European project and the political drivers, and I, that is the beginning, it's very important to notice that this, in geopolitical terms, is a, a project of management of decline. So France and Germany and the others saw that they were so weak after the first half of the second of the 20th century, uh, that they could not keep up in international relations on their own. So they needed to do this revolutionary thing for their own sake. But this is deeply conservative. This is about um, staying in life. (laughs) So this is deeply conservative. And and this is what I mean with the paradox. We, We see our project of European integration often as very progressive. You know, this is a, a progressive thing. We are an example to the world. We, we, we will show. But we are in, in the nature of the project. We are deeply conservative. This is difficult. Mm. This is difficult. And self-understanding on, on this would be, I think, is very important and would also be very helpful. And i give you one example. Um, I was at the high point of the Euro crisis. I was in a confidential meeting in The Hague with a high uh, um, advisor of the Chinese government. And he was in The Hague, and he wanted to talk about European integration. And just like the Brazilians, <coughs> he was fascinated by it. He said, what is European integration? And especially, he was explaining the way the European Union deals with the financial economic crisis. And everybody in the room was saying, <laughs> we are not dealing with this. It was then too little, too late. We are almost, we are almost gone. You know, the euro is ready to explode. And then, and so he thought, first, the people in the, in the room thought he was joking, but then they looked and then, no, so it's the Chinese government advising, he cannot be joking, he <laughs> must be serious. And then he said, no, I'm very serious, because what fascinates me, and then he explained it very clearly, is the ability to not act. 
is so so important in our perspective, the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. perspective, because the, the disasters are so huge that if you act on the day of the disaster, you will surely make very, very yeah. many mistakes and also very severe mistakes. So you have to wait and see, but that's the most difficult thing. Yeah, yeah. We Chinese want to wait and see because that is our approach to the world. And you are practicing it with institutional structures. How, do yeah, yeah. how did delaying. you devise these structures? <laughs> and, and, by we, design, and we call right? this inefficiency. <laughs> you know, and that is what I mean. So I think we have to rediscover yeah. the strengths also of this inefficiency. And my last is a reading tip to the audience. Uh, read the, the, the marvelous essay by George Steiner about the idea of Europe. That is, that's the title, where he explains exactly what you, what you said uh, just a couple of minutes ago. That Europe is so diverse, it's, it's uh, by definition focused on small scale. Small scale is inefficient. The way we Europeans travel is by foot. There's no other part in the world where people still prefer to travel by foot. I'm here from Maastricht, I'm in Lisbon and I start strolling around. <laughs> you know, that is very, very European. I come in a cafe and I want a newspaper, and it's there. And, and I start a conversation with somebody who lives in, yeah. in Lisbon. And this inefficiency is a strength, but we don't know it. Yeah. Well, never thought about it like that. So thank you for that, uh, that insight. So far, I don't know, I, I'm, um, uh, um, maybe um, you could share some thoughts on this. Be coming back to that cultural thing, because I think we're <coughs> coming back to that, right? It's like somehow we don't realize our own identity already, what we have in common, and we've been somehow maybe neglecting that cultural aspect. Uh, so how can we recover that somehow? I mean, if, if you would be in Brussels, <laughs> Ooh, <okay. laughs> what sort right. of agenda would you set? So I think the, fir the first thing, just, and I will respond to your question, but I think it's very important to really highlight um, the term identity, and it's something that I think different people said, but it's just to really st uh, highlight the fact that European identity, or the definition of European identity, differs by definition from that of traditionally, you know, associated with the state, which is based on mm. similarity, similarities. Europe as I see it, you know, the European identity is about relations between differences, right? So it's about having a common framework of values which allows to st uh, regulate, structure that difference while still allowing for that difference to flourish, right? Within some legal limits, for example, hence issues around, uh, you know, freedom of expression, yes, with some limits, right? So for me, that is European identity. So it's, uh, in a, if you want, you know, in, in, on a theoretical framework, it's more the Republican, right? Yeah. It's, um, you, it's about be, being, um, uh, participating in this civic, in this process yeah. of active membership, about respecting some laws, rather than uh, being um, um, European because, simply because you were born there or because you're part of this community that is somehow connected, you know, throughout time, which is the communitarian approach. So I think European identity is an active process. You know, there are all these conversations in feminism in which there's this theory, um, which I support. You're, you're not born a woman, you become a woman. I think you're born, you become an European. So Europe, as you said, is a process of becoming, right? And the reason why, and now this connects what you just said, is that I think when, you, when we look at cultural policy, you know, cultural policy at the European level is a competence of the nation, of the state. And the commission, you know, the treaty does allow the commission to support it. And the Commission has been attempting to do so. However, it is very much constrained. And what he has been trying to do is to establish some forms of cooperation. And so what this means is, in reality, for example, that you know, the Commission will support projects of exchange, right? Now, I think, and I've written about this and other people have written about this, you know, exchange does not mean building commonality. Exchange might mean showing our differences and highlighting our differences. I think that the European project and the European approach to culture should focus on highlighting our, uh, our common values and building together, right? Yeah. Building an understanding of, com of history, of, uh, of uh, you know, cultural productions in which individuals are working together across disciplines, across borders, right? Across communities. And 
and this is not being done, you know, for several reasons. I mm. think, namely, because some states would probably try to block this, yeah. like Hungary, like Poland. Um, but I mean, the question is, you know, do we? What does it mean when a community or a union of different countries allows for some of its members to block? that shared action. I think we have a big issue there that we have to... There's an element of governance as well. An element of governance, yes, which limits then that possibility of actually yeah. developing our, our, our ties. And just if I could just go back to what you said sure. around leaders. I mean, for me, as a citizen, this is my personal opinion, you know, the fact that we elect... Europe, um, when we elect MEPs, so members of the European Parliament, we do so across state lines, I think that this is really not great to say the least because then these MEPs in some cases, not always, but will then vote according to the <coughs> interests, supposed interests, short-term interests of their country. country. Yeah. I think we should have transnational laws, uh, uh, lists and I say this as a European citizen yeah. who believes in the European project. Thank you. Maybe, maybe it's a good time to open up the conversation for people in the audience, if anyone would like to ask a question or disagree with what is being said here. I find it very I find it very interesting that instead of focusing on the difference uh, and on the prejudice between uh, north and south, and so in the, between the differences that Fons has, uh, has highlighted, which exist on of, I mean of being, but also of perception, you have chosen the conversation also due to the to focus on the identity and what unites us. And I think one of the best ways to see what unites us is when we are outside Europe. Because I, I mean, I'm, I've had this feeling for many years. I was an official at the Foreign Affairs Ministry, so I've always been negotiating with uh, in different European issues. And so we would be, I mean, first 15, then, uh, then okay, 27, uh, negotiating around the table. And it was very clear the differences, you know, that the Dutch are like this, the Germans are like this, the Portuguese. Okay, so they are, they're in reality. There are different styles of negotiation that you, after some years, you, you understand and you, it's, and usually they work. So it's something that we pass from people to say, okay, now with the Dutch you do like this, with the no, no, you go, okay. No, it's kind of informal uh, consensus within the Foreign Affairs Ministry in Portugal and in every country. Uh, and you see sometimes the differences highlighted, but it's very interesting when you are outside Europe, for instance, when I'm now more in the United States, and you, I mean, we start, we are in a, I mean, a conversation with the Americans, okay, and if someone from Europe comes, you understand, you feel, the, okay, this is, uh, <laughs> this is from my part, you see? It's very, it's very, uh, that, that I find very interesting. Also, I agree with you on the sense that uh, the European identity is not, uh, is not how we are equal, is how, uh, or how we are similar to each other, is how we live well with our differences. Of course, I, th I do believe, I agree with your um, European values. I mean, we have the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, where we have said, I mean, we have listed the values that we believe in. Democracy, rule of law, freedom, uh, equal rights. I mean, th there's a, a list of values which are important for, uh, for us. And we have stated, and the, all member states have said that this is important to us. But I like the definition that European identity is allowing us to be different. And that is very important. Because we are different, we have centuries of history of being different and lots of times being at war with each other. And it's, it's great that we are now able to focus the difference mostly on football <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then being... No, it's great. I mean, we, we don't do it by war, we do it by football, which is much simpler. So, yeah. So, just a comment. Thank you. Give the Peace Nobel Prize to the football, uh, <laughs> to UEFA. I don't know if that will fly very well. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. My name is Satu Suikarikleev and I'm ambassador of Finland here in Portugal. Thank you so much. It's been very uh, uh, inspiring, thought-provoking, um, uh, the, the uh, amusing, <laughs> uh, the uh, 
the, the um, and extremely useful, and I think it's so timely. And also because uh, I, I, I can, sort of the whole discussion about the European identity and building together all this, I think is highly relevant now when we are talking about ways how to make Europe more competitive and more innovative, how we as Europe, you know, the open... Uh, strategic autonomy and all that, how can we create more together? So I, I think that we need it more than ever. I mean, this, you know, this really spirit of not just cooperating, not just uh, exchanging, but really to, to join forces forces together. And, uh, uh, but I think that, I mean, you know, like the Erasmus exchange, I think that they can be uh, really, um, um, I mean, they can be vital. I mean, they are extremely good. And, and I just wanted to give example my, myself, like 30 years ago when I was a law student uh, from Finland, you know, civil law, I went to England. And before I went there, I thought, that, oh my God, it's a common law, Wild West, you know, how can they live in that kind of legal system? I went there. After a few weeks, I was like, oh my God, civil law, a Wild West. How can we live, you know, <laughs> with so few rules? So it kind of, a, you know, I think it was such a good example of, of, uh, of, of showing how, you know, I can get, you know, you can get rid of your prejudices uh, very quickly when you actually go there and do things together. Uh, and I, some of you were talking about, you know, whether it can, I think it was you who said that can the identity grow naturally by, you know, by itself. And I hope that yes, but I think that we, you know, we need those pushes. We need those pushes a lot. And, uh, and, and of course, for students, there are great opportunities, but we need to do it in, you know, uh, among other, uh, other people as well, more than we have. And, uh, you know, for instance, companies. Uh, and I think that we, you know, now with the the, 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 uh, with the recovery funds, for instance, that are European funds. I mean, that gives a great framework for uh, European companies really to, uh, really to go uh, to sit down together and see that, okay, what could we uh, do together to respond to this? I mean, it's a European huge uh, you know, project fund, but the implementation is very national, sort of a nationally focused. We all have our national programs, but we, we don't have to be you know, tied by that, we can we can make it European, and we actually have had great you know discussions here in Portugal how we can you know start bilaterally, really you know looking how we we can join forces uh, and and um, the the uh, uh, to create together to to, to not just to uh, uh, you know export and import and invest in and and and, and so forth, but you know co-creation. So I uh, the the. Uh, um, I think it's a it's a it's a you know very good very good discussion and um, timely and uh, and and also I do need I do think that it's uh, because these are perceptions but but you know uh, and as we saw you know there is you know truth in truth in is as well but as we said you know it's a diversity you know let's find the strengths strengths in that uh, but I think that in this process to find also those that unite us are, is so important uh, and uh, you know, I came here a year ago and I you know I find these similarities all the time we are from opposite ends of of, of Europe, but it's, you know, we are so similar in so many respects, and, and uh, uh, the latest thing, you know, in, in all spheres of life, and the latest thing I, I, which I think is wonderful that I found we are, com uh, that connects us is lynx, you know, that wonderful uh, wild cat. We have them in north, northern Finland, and place where my father is from, it's the, sort of the, the local animal there, and when I went to Alenteju, I was like, rediscovered that they have, you know, rehabilitated the lynx here, mm -hmm. and there are not many places in Europe where you have those, so, you know, even, even this little thing when we feel like, oh, wow. <laughs> So I just wanted to make this comment. One question, please. I really liked uh, um, uh, Fons, if I may call you uh, the the what you this uh, uh, peach peach uh, coconut, coconut thing. Coconut, yes, yeah. and I would like to learn. You know, if I I would like to you if you could give us more lessons from it. You know, concrete lessons. What can we, you know, what can we do? You talk about talked about something I wrote down. Take a lot of private moments, but please, if you can elaborate. That would be welcome. Thank you. So, elucidate us on the coconuts. Yeah. <laughs> now, we, um, we, we Dutch are trying to separate privacy from public life. And therefore, if we discuss things at the table, we don't say it because we know, but don't take it as a personal offend, right? Um, in other cultures, it's all mixed. Uh, if you say something bad about your policy, you say that person is bad, right? 
And the Dutch say, no, it's just your IDs suck. You're okay, yeah? <laughs> now, you, you laugh about it, but it's, it's almost a, a true stereotype. Um, and in private moments, then you don't feel it shared amongst others. Uh, and what we found, and it's a very practical tip, that loss of face is not there if it's not made public, yeah. if it's between you, right? And then they will appreciate a lot your direct feedback because that's what, let's say, Portuguese and Spanish people do themselves. But in, it's a bit like for everybody, if uh, your father or mother is saying something nonsensical, you rather keep them separate and say, Dad, can, I, can you, yeah? You don't say that in public, out of respect. And uh, now this is called high and low context communication. High context communication is you need to know the context knowing what people say. So if, if, uh, if English people is always the best example, not, not British, but English people say, you have an interesting face. Uh, and, and my brother-in-law happens to be a plastic surgeon, yeah? <laughs> it's kind of, what the hell is he saying? Well, the Dutch would just say, you're ugly, and by the way, your ears are too big, yeah? Um, in fact, we say the same, but you need context, and you see it in humor. Huh? In America, it's very easy. It's low-context humor, and if you don't laugh, it's the television that laughs for you. But you have, bah! Well, if you look at Monty Python, you say, what the hell is this about? <laughs> and if you don't understand the context, you, don't know, you know it's funny, but not exactly what it is, right? And those are links to the peach and the coconut, right? And, and uh, yeah, let, let me not take much time, but it's, all these things are pretty important if you go a bit deeper, but that needs uh, a bit more time, yeah. Uh, please, please. We had also in the back uh, a comment there. Um, I don't want to spoil the party because we're discussing so much uh, commonalities and how we can overcome. One of the things that I think is threatening this is the growing inequality that we see. Uh, in, and it's an issue that we, we see in many countries. So um, how, how do we, and, that's, uh, and then we see frustration and people, uh, you know, uh, finding back their, their feeling fear and coming back to very conservative, maybe nationalistic uh, feelings. So how, and that's quite a, I mean, if you look at my own country, it's quite a part of our political system and we see it growing even here in Portugal. So if we, w we can build and we have the Erasmus and things like that, but that's all on a level which I would say uh, rationally we understand and so on. But this is more the emotional side also. So how do we build this identity taking that into account? Can I yes, very absolutely. briefly react? Because I think that this is exactly one of the points that I really would love to make today. Uh, what we forget about uh, the drivers of European integration, the original drivers, is that there were two. One was security against the enemy, but the other was battling poverty. Battling poverty it was in the treaties as of the European Coal and Steel Community Treaty in, in 1951. We forgot about that. And it was there because this was the lesson of the Great Depression of the 1930s, when also polarization of societies was driven by economic inequalities that were structural, that were structural and that were, were dividing societies in camps. Uh, and that battling of poverty was never really picked up on after the Treaty of Rome in 1957, because as of then it was all about the internal market and the free movement. <coughs> It is still in the treaties. It is in the treaties, but as a promise, not as something that is turned into ex executive uh, policies. And um, I think that is, that is may maybe the main challenge of today to bring that back, because this is also one of the, the, the big explanatory for uh, forces in my uh, view of the first years of European integration because why was it a credible project of cooperation between nation states? Also because it 
it tackled this problem of poverty and social inequality. And I think we have to have that back on the agenda. This is not the stance of the Dutch government, by the way. Um, but it's very important, and I want to praise the, the Portuguese uh, presidency of the EU for making an effort to put that again on the agenda, because yeah. it was one of the priorities of the Portuguese uh, presidency, uh, presidency yeah. uh, and that I think that is indeed very urgent. Yeah. And we saw also how inequality also uh, fires populism as well, right? So uh, it's all connected there. Precisely. I think we can... Uh, we can um, give it a new approach because it can be a stance of the Dutch government if we um, if we look at it differently. Uh, I know there will never be some kind of European social security system. That's something that the Dutch and the Germans, etc., will never allow. But what we can do, we yesterday evening we ate together and we talked about things that were happening in our countries. And there were a lot of similarities. The housing market, yeah. uh, inequality, uh, people who don't feel at home in Europe anymore, who feel abandoned, who, well, who vote for populist parties, etc. So uh, instead of just finger pointing at each other, which is also has been a very European solution f since the financial crisis, unfortunately, we could set, sit down together and uh, uh, with your experience about negotiation without our directness, uh, your more subt subtle and modest behavior, we can join forces and we can fight and we can share, um, um, for example, uh, best examples. We can, uh, we can learn from each other, I think. I think we re really can do that uh, without being too patronizing. And um, if we sit down together, I think we, we do understand each other better. Um, yeah, I, I really think that's mm -hmm. that's a better approach than top down looking for new leadership, looking for a stronger European Commission. It's better to 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 sit down together in teams, um, uh, a housing market expert, a social security expert, pension experts, and then we 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 can um, discover that there are more similarities than differences in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any any thoughts from you on that uh, on that note on inequality and poverty? I can actually, I can actually refer that uh, at a different level across countries where we have very different levels of development at universities, for instance. The Commission has made a tremendous effort in the past to try to equalize somehow the treatment of, it's about income redistribution, right? Yeah. About about uh, understanding the different needs from different regions. One very important example for all of us at European universities is now this initiative that started a few years ago by Macron of creating this European University Alliances with the requisite that each alliance would have different representatives from different parts of Europe. It's not north-south, it's east-west, it's uh, uh, from developing countries. And, other, and the idea, the whole idea of this design and all the financial incentives that the Commission has to distribute to universities will take into consideration the way these alliances have been constructed and built. And this is a clear effort uh, although subtle, yeah. to uh, fight some sort of inequality in the way universities as active agents in our European society behave. Because you cannot really compare a public university from Slovenia with a top university in the United Kingdom. They don't have the same resources, they don't have uh, the same means of working, the same network of collaborators, but they have people potentially as talented. And the way to actually fight, this is a different sort of inequality. I know that inequality yeah. may assume many different ways, but since you invited me as sure, an expert in <laughs> university field, I'm sharing this very important European value because it's truly a European value to build a society of knowledge yeah. that has its uh, ground on our universities. Yeah. So, um, Mafal, I don't know if you have a comment on that. Otherwise, I'll just uh, maybe give the words for one of the... And then we have Pedro as well for the final remarks because I think uh, we're... Yeah, is it okay? So I'll just pass on the microphone. 
Um, well, um, I think it was also building on what the ambassador was sharing now, um, because I felt also in this debate, like um, working with this imaginary line of the division of the north of the south that uh, we were sharing also during the discussion, uh, and like the Google Maps, you know, when you zoom in and then the distance is changing. I work for the Council of Europe, so talking about European identity, we also have different, uh, oh, a more diverse composition there. But I work for the North South Center of the Council of Europe. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, for us, the North South Division has the world map as a reference, and then we are zooming in here in this discussion. And uh, when I was listening to the different um, input shared today, I think that I was resonating also with the argument of the ambassador because the discussion was zooming in, of course, to the differences within uh, the European Union, but at the same time very much focuses on values, behaviors, perceptions. Perhaps not that much on resources, which is another line of the division. And I think that this is something that when the question is there of it's a reality or is it fiction, and I come from an organization that uh, was born in the late 80s uh, as a result of the whole process of decolonization, rising globalization, and then being very prominent, the, world south, the global north and the global south division, and what are the core responsibilities in the process of um, fighting global challenges. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, what the Human Development Index was saying is that inequality is back to the levels of the 80s in many cases. So I think that the question put forward by the ambassador is also very much pertinent in how we address that. And of course, uh, we said it in the beginning. I was following the beginning because I arrived late. Sorry, um, very apologizing for that. But I was following it on the YouTube already. So that was very good. <laughs> Um, it was said in the beginning that it's not now for, you know, having the conclusions, but, you know, to, to exchange views. Um, and perhaps the question is about this as well, because we work a lot in the North South Centre with intercultural dialogue as a bridge from the dilemmas, you know, trying to reach this mutual understanding, because mutual understanding also leads to social cohesion and mobilizes solidarity as well. And we're, strugg we're struggling now because intercultural dialogue is something that is very difficult to build online. <laughs> and I was wondering also, uh, perhaps to put the question there, um, how you work on all these uh, elements that you were sharing before when you have a format that is already restricting so much to reach the commonalities. And we can open even a discussion about technology and innovation and we were talking about polarization and there is the filter bubbles where everyone is just channeling through one direction. So what is the common ground in a world that communicates, communicates mostly online when we are also talking about these divisions? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone would like to take this? Yeah, maybe, maybe phones. Uh, Corona and the pandemic, we have done a lot of dilemma reconciliation online. And it has an enormous amount of advantages because a lot of uh, the so-called inequalities disappear, especially if people are on mute. Yeah? Um, and especially if you can put them on mute. Yeah? Uh, but the beauty of dilemma reconciliation, because l l let the be there be no misunderstanding by showing the differences, I think they're wonderful, those differences. Because if you are only at the top or only at the bottom, you're just half what you could be. And my point is that you need to combine those differences. And dilemma reconciliation is the process of doing so. Now, we have six steps. First, what is the dilemma? Not unimportant. And uh, the dilemmas are always two positives that are fighting. A dilemma is not a positive versus a negative. You just go for the positive. Um, so it's two positives fighting, then the second step is charting the dilemma, make it more specific to your group. The third step is stretching the dilemma, what are the pluses and minuses on each side. And then you, step four, exaggerate the negatives, you saw my cartoons, uh, make them negative because you don't want to be there. And then step five is the reconciliation, what can I do with X that gives me more of Y, see what happens. Even on Zoom, it's amazing what people come up with because it's equal, your side is not better than my side, we need each other, and then what can we do to make this happen? Um, 
so I'm, I'm very optimistic, but this is business to have a clear goal. And uh, because handicaps of dilemma reconciliation are two. We think that the two axes are of the same length. They're very often not. Uh, with our clients, they are because that's why they invite us. <laughs> Um, and uh, the second one, is there a will to reconcile? The beauty of reconciliation is you don't replace your values by others, you enrich your value by the opposite. Great individuals give it back to society, great societies nurture excellent individuals. And, and I, I met Charles Hamden Turner who said he read my thesis in 82, my God. And Charles, typical Cambridge professor, I draft holes, I read it, and I, I, we can work together. I reconciled all your dilemmas. I said, what do you mean? What the hell? And he said, yeah, I thought you were another Dutchman putting the world on bipolar scales. Let me explain, Fods, and he speaks a bit like a Cambridge professor. If you are an individualist at the cost of the collective, you're an egoist, and it doesn't work. If you're a collectivist at the cost of the individual, you're a communist, and it doesn't work. So if both ends of your scale don't work, why don't you try to combine them? And uh, that took me 15 years to really understand. Um, what I will offer your institute is our methodology uh, for using this. And, and uh, yesterday at the dinner I was saying, the worst you can do is vote on a dilemma, which is another word for referendum, right? Because they always end in 4951. You have a civil war after it. Yeah, and you say, oh, yeah. What does it mean, my vote? That was the most quoted l language uh, after uh, the day of voting of Brexit. We have an alternative, and that's artificial intelligence. You have 35 million Brits, and you ask them, what is the key word that comes to your mind if we leave Europe? And what is the key word that comes to your mind when you stay in Europe? And the computer will do the rest, <laughs> because they will say, oh, that's then the solution. And the main question is, how can our drive for autonomy help us to get better trade agreements, right? Rather than choosing between the two. Uh, but that's the type of work we're doing at the moment because I'm 68 and I need artificial intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> and a new voice. Yeah, and I think for breakfast we're already late for that one, yeah. right? Yes, please. Yeah. I, I have to disagree with that last uh, statement, uh, Fons, uh, unfortunately. No, no, but I, I, I want to make a remark about it. Um, so I agree with your worries about the online world. The online world is a divider as much as it is an equalizer. Uh, and it's, in, it's used in wrong hands uh, often. We, we have seen examples already all over the place. And I think this is a particular European challenge because this is in the end about rule of law. And there is no rule of law in this dimension of society. And it's not up to the Americans to come up with ideas on this. We have to do it ourselves. So this is typically something where we have to take, where we can and must take the lead if we want to control it, because it's, it's, it's extremely worrisome, especially in a world where you have haves and have-nots uh, and an online equalizer that is yeah, polarizing uh, every society at the, at the moment. So uh, thank you for your input. <laughs> Good, thank you. I think we have time now, Pedro. We have. We want to have your insights and in summary. Yes, we'll give you the. I'll give you my mic. If you could share, you want to connect your computer or no? No, 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 no. Sorry. just yeah. some notes. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, for the invitation. I, I feel I feel bad about interrupting this discussion. It was so interesting. I feel like an kind of an intruder, uh, but it's my role. And I, I wanted to split my role in two parts. I wanted to say something about the topic, and then I, I wanted to say something about the things that you said about the topic. Uh, when, I, when I knew about the topic, I was trying to think, uh, what, was, what might be the oldest reference to this sort of north-south dichotomy in a way that we recognize it? And I thought, and I was completely wrong, but I thought it was Montesquieu. So you remember Montesquieu, l'esprit des lois, the, the theory of the separation of powers. Actually, most of the esprit des lois, it's about this climate theory of society. Uh, and I, I realized this much later, because as a political scientist, you read it for the separation of powers, but th there's a lot of stuff about climate. And what he says about climate is very interesting. So let me just make sure. Uh, so there's the north, which is cold, and because of that, it has more vigorous people they're braver, uh, they have a sense of superiority, 
They are more honest, cleverer, and less suspicious towards others. And then the South, because it's so warm, people are idle, they're more emotional, they're more passive. There's a terrible passage that he says that they prefer to be slaves than to be industrious. Uh, and if you think about this, I mean, this is a very stark version, right? But if you think about this, it's kind of the stereotype or, or part of the stereotype that still prevails among some people. He also says something very interesting. When I think it was Fons who said that when you're reading these manuals, you smell the nationality of the author, Montesquieu actually thinks that the best solution is to combine a little bit of both, north and south, so the temperate climate provides the ideal citizen. And what is the country where this ideal citizen lives? Take a guess. <laughs> It's astonishing. It's France, right? I mean, who could know? It's an amazing coincidence. It's fascinating. A high level of science. So it might surprise you to know that social psychologists have done a lot of work about this Montesquieu hypothesis. And they've done it in light of a more modern approach to this with this personality theory, right? Uh, I mean, you've probably heard about this. It's like main five personality traits. And so you have the extroverts, That'll be us in the South. You have the conscientious, conscientiousness, people who plan, people who are goal-directed. So they've tried to measure two kinds of things. It's what they've tried to do. They've tried to measure if people in the North and the South have different personalities. Turns out they don't, right? There's no relationship between distance from the equator or climate and personality type. But there is a very strong relationship between what people think the North and the South, people living in the North and the South are, and the, the way they assign these personality traits. And that's another thing, I think it was Milton who said this, and this is a fascinating result from this research. That it's not only about North of Europe and South of Europe. Within countries, the stereotype prevails. We know this very well in Portugal, for example. In, in the North, people work a lot, and they are very liberal and individual. In the South, we're all lazy, and they call us, you know, Moors, basically. Uh, so, so these are very powerful ideas. They have no connection with reality in terms of personality. I, I'll talk about the culture in a minute, because that's a different point. Um, but th these are very powerful ideas. Uh, they're especially powerful, for example, in a country like Italy, where the contrast between north and south does not exist in terms of personality types, but exists very strongly in terms of stereotypes. And is shared, by the way, by the people in the south, which is what stereotypes do, right? Um, a last story about this. There's a country that deviates from this. I'm not going to ask you to guess because we don't have a lot of time. But of course, it's Britain. Uh, so in Britain, but it deviates in a very interesting way. So in Britain, the Northerns are the ones that are perceived, perceived and perceive themselves as more extrovert, more sociable. And the people in England, of course, are the ones who perceive themselves and are perceived as kind of the silent type, you know, the stiff upper lip, the kind of... Uh, but there's an element here that's absent, which is the work part, the hard working. There's no negative stereotype attached to the Scots or vice versa to the English about being hard working and being organized. And the reason, when you think about this, is very simple. The Industrial Revolution took place at the same time in Scotland and in England. Actually, a lot of it dependent from, Scot dependent from Scotland. So it's interesting to see what kind of, of elements of the stereotype persist, what elements don't. And the last aspect about this, this is when I realized I was completely wrong about Mont Montesquieu being the first reference to the North versus South. So the first reference people talk about is, of course, the father of historians, Heraclitus. And he had the theory about the ideal kind of climate that produced the ideal people. It was also the temperate climate, but there's a small difference. So the cold personnel was, was Scythia, 
which is basically Ukraine and Russia. And there, there's this terrible warm weather in Egypt, but the ideal type is Greece, of course. So, I mean, there's no surprise there. The Romans, also, the Romans reversed, right? The, the north was the place of the politically, culturally, economically deficient societies. They were, the, the south was the right thing. And if, if think about this, even with Montesquieu, uh, up until the 18th century, this reverse compared to some of the prevailing stereotypes today, stereotype prevailed, even think about Goethe, or think about Schiller. What is the paragon of civilization? It's Italy. It's not Germany. Germany doesn't even really kind of exist. It's Italy. So this, all of this that we've been talked about, uh, about these kinds of stereotypes and ideas about North and South, are a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. So I, I wanted to make this point about North and South, because there are a lot of interesting, curious things here. Of course, since this is today um, shared, these stereotypes are shared, are widespread, this makes them very powerful. And it's not surprising that they reappear in the context of the economic crisis, for example. Uh, who can explain the economic and the financial crisis? It's too complicated. Politicians need to communicate and they communicate in ways that makes things as simple as possible. And so you have here in Portugal, you know, the evil at the time, then things change, the evil Germans and the evil Finns, right? And then in the north you had all those lazy Spaniards. This is a simple way to communicate because it connects with strong and deep-seated stereotypes and perceptions, which are very difficult to change. In any case, I wanted to finish and now commenting on what you said in a more optimistic light. Um, one of the topics today was European identity. Um, and I think that it's something that we would, I mean, in my case, I do survey research, it's a super difficult thing to measure. You don't even know exactly if you are measuring what you want to measure. You ask people, do you feel only Portuguese or Portuguese and European or only European? People answer this question. This question is used by you know, thousands of researchers. We don't know exactly if this means that people have an European identity. It's not clear. Um, there's something that we know. Not so much from the service, but from, from observation. The notion of European identity may exist in several ways, cultural, civic, but the notion that we belong to the same political community, that doesn't exist. Yet, that doesn't exist. And we saw that during the financial crisis. We saw that, that we do not feel we belong to the same political community. But as several people said, so João talked about an ongoing process, Matteo, this too short of an experience. Uh, uh, let me tell you an apocryphal story, probably not true, but it's a nice story, about Portugal. So it happens by the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. So there's a king, King Don Carlos, is riding by the beach and he finds a group of fishermen, right? And he asks them, are you Portuguese or Spaniards? And they answer, well, neither. We're from Povo de Verzim, <laughs> which is, by, at the time, a small village in the north. So the point is, it takes a long time. A national identity it took a national education system. It took national media. I mean, even in Italy, I mean, before Hai, I'm not sure everybody's really, really Italian. So it takes a long time. But this would not be made easier, and I'm thinking about something my father said, if politicians, and I'm not, I mean, I understand why they do it, but this is the reality. If politicians blame Brussels for everything that's wrong and take the credit for everything that's right, I mean, this is the opposite of the path we need for a political community. So I, I, I said I was going to be an optimist. I'm a bit of an optimist and pessimist here. <laughs> the political incentives are often not there to foster this community, but remember also that 
they were probably not there historically in many moments. And it took a long time to build national communities. It will take a long time to, to build a European community, yeah, identity, sorry. I wanted to say a last thing about cultural differences. I think Fonz is right. I think they're there, they exist. But we need to think about what kind of differences are those? What is their nature? And I wanted to give you an anecdotal example and then a more scientific example. So I lived in two periods in the United States. Uh, in the first period, uh, I didn't drive. I thought I could survive by walking in public transport. I was barely survived, right? <laughs> and then in the second period, I drove. And there's a fascinating thing that you find. I mean, surveys are great. You ask people questions, that's fine. But economists know that there are stated preferences and revealed preferences. And I, I want to talk about the revealed preferences. I, I'm not a very bad driver. I'm not a saint either. But when I got into the US and I started driving, my behavior changed completely. Completely. And this will happen. I mean, I'm thinking about Southern European people here. This will happen with all of you if you drive there. So culture exists, but it's also contextual. If the incentives around you, and you, and, you, and you see them immediately, if the incentives around you are the appropriate ones, your behavior also changes. Let me give you a more scientific example. So people talk a lot about social trust as a very important element of how much, so the question we ask in service is, do you tend to trust all the people, or do you think you can't be too careful? And in Portugal, most people say you can't be too careful. And in Sweden, most people say you can trust everybody. And this happens mostly in the Nordic countries. Uh, and everybody else is somewhere in between. We are really down there as a distrustful people. And this is argued to have a lot of important economic social consequences. But the interesting thing is that if you look at immigrants, when they move from one country to the other, they adapt almost immediately. If you ask them about social trust, if you measure social trust in a lot of different ways, you find they adapt very quickly, especially when they move to countries where the average level of trust is higher. It's harder for people to lose trust if they come, let's say, from Sweden to Portugal, and it's easy, quick to gain trust if you move from Portugal to Sweden. And the second generation, the adaptation is complete. There's no trace of the original level of social trust. So what I want to say, what I want to finish by saying, is that these cultural differences are there, but there's really nothing, maybe, nothing intrinsic or essential about them. A lot of it is, you look around, you see what the incentives are there, you see how other people behave, you adapt. And, and the, the optimistic message I wanted to leave is that Europe was never only about movement of goods and capital, it was also about movement of people, and there's no other way to produce a European identity besides allowing people to move. And that's why we have a little bit of a tragedy, COVID is a, was a tragedy from that point of view. There's an even greater tragedy, which is the anti-immigration discourse uh, from this point of view, but compare what happened in the financial crisis and what happened now in COVID. So we had two major crises in the last 10 years. The, 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 the motive I see for this discussion is very much rooted in that original crisis. Things were very different this time. Of course, there were the four frugal ones, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle there, but everything changed very quickly. I, Maybe because the nature of the problem is very different. I'm sure the nature of the problem is very, very different. But maybe because we've also learned something. And that's the optimistic message I wanted to leave. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. So, um, Ambassador, I don't know if you want to share uh, any words uh, to close it. I think we're all uh, eager for a drink, I guess. <laughs> 
I, I just want to thank everybody very much for, for these very rich discussions. As I said, I'm not going to go into conclusions. I think this is a wonderful start. Uh, and uh, I, I really look forward to continue to speak with all of you uh, here, what you thought of the discussion and uh, how we can overcome differences, but how we can use differences as well to become better uh, as Europeans, I would say. Okay, thanks a lot, all of you.